So how can Apollo Alter Network's next generation file protect your data center? In this video, I will show you. If this is your first time here, I'm Lars from Consigas. We call ourselves the Apollo Alter Network's experts because the next generation file is our passion. It's what we do all day every day, migrating firewalls, providing managed services and most important, implementing security best practices. When I started to work with this box in 2010, barely anyone knew about Palo Alto Networks. But as an engineer I felt that this solution will change the world of cybersecurity. And yes, today we know it did big time, because it's one of the few security solutions that can truly secure your network. However, there's a caveat. You need to set it up in the right way in order to be effective. Because while it's awesome, it's not a magic box. So over the years we became a professional services partner for Palo Alto Networks as well as one of a few elite authorized training centers. And with working in the field for so many years and being a trainer, I would like to share my experience with you. So over the next couple of weeks and months, we release new videos and core concepts explaining the fundamental workings of the next generation firewall, starting with the trend landscape, then deployment methods, NAT, AppID, SSL decryption, VPNs, and many more. So follow us on LinkedIn, YouTube or Twitter to stay up to date. But now let's have a look how to protect your data center. So to start with, same as what we explained before for the, the, the protecting an end user device, it is very important to note that um, the only protection, the only way how we can really secure a network is with a the right combination of the right uh, trap prevention techniques, right? So there is not a single trap prevention technique which, you know, like magic can protect our network and provide 100% protection, right? It's always, you know, what I like to call the magic sauce, right? The kind of the right combination of the right trap prevention techniques implemented on the firewall, okay? So now, um, let's have a look. So at the first step, uh, what a hacker can do is kind of do a reconnaissance attack. Okay, so these can be port scans, um, also information disclosure attacks. So what a hacker does here is first of all try to find out what services are you running in your data center, running a web server, maybe you have RDP inbound access allowed and things, stuff like this, right? And then in the second step, he would try to run a reconnaissance attack where he tries to find out, okay, right, I know you're running a web server. Now, you know, what version of web server are you running? Maybe, you know, some vulnerable uh, old IIS version 6 uh, 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 web server, right, uh, which you can then attack. Okay, now to prevent your reconnaissance attack, what we can do first of all is uh, DOS zone protection. Okay, so as part of the denial of source protection on the firewall, we can block host sweeps and port scans. Okay, and with this, we already kind of uh, limit the, the chat surface. And these zone protection profiles, they're very effective because what we can do here really is say, right, if we see a scan, Right, block this IP address uh, for an entire hour. Really, kind of blacklist these IP address, and um, that's really effective because hackers, you know, they don't want to waste their resources neither, right? If they kind of go after a target and they get, they see straight away they're getting getting blocked. Well, then just move to the next target. They're not going to waste their time, right? So, kind of doing these very basic, you know, housekeeping things at the beginning are really effective. Um, you should, you know, not neglect them. So then, next thing would be. Um, uh, kind of a blocking the higher uh, traffic from high risk sources. So like countries, okay? Um, if you have a service and you know, okay, the service is only accessed from user from a specific country, let's say your home country, right? Then this is really effective because you can say, well, like in our case, right, okay, I'm hosting a service for Ireland, so I'm only allowing traffic from Ireland, okay? The other way what we can do as well with this is instead of kind of such a positive allow list, we can also do a negative block list, meaning we can say, right, um, allow traffic to my web service from everyone in the world, but not from specific countries. And then you can, you know, list uh, kind of certain countries where you know, okay, from there you're receiving a lot of threats, but uh, usually not, not uh, kind of doing have any business relations or there are no, no users in these countries. Okay. Um, so, you know, blocking based on country, really good, but also limited, right? Because uh, often kind of a lot of attacks we see from big countries like the United States, uh, France, Germany, right? So countries which are pretty big, right? Um, 
uh, and where we do have users, right? So we cannot just block traffic uh, from these users. So here, dynamic block lists are very helpful. So first of all, since version 8.0, Palo Alto Networks now provides its own list of bad or kind of uh, IP addresses. I got a two lists, kind of a confirmed one and uh, kind of a high risk uh, list of kind of bad IP addresses. And then in addition, you can also actually define your own dynamic block list. So there are a lot of kind of providers out there like Spam House, for instance, who provide kind of IB block lists, both kind of paid ones, but also a lot of free ones, right? Um, and these ones you can actually digest into the firewall, meaning you tell the firewall, hey, you know, every hour or maybe even every uh, 15 minutes, go out and kind of pull the updated list of kind of bad IP addresses from these ones and then block all of the access from and to um, these IP addresses. The only challenge is that uh, often the, the way the format in which these IP address lists are provided cannot directly be digested by the firewall. That's why in uh, a lot of cases you will need another tool called MindMelt. It's a free tool provided by Palo Alto Networks, right? And MindMelt is pretty cool because what we can do here is you can, you know, take feeds from companies. You can see here Spam House, for instance, or OpenBL, um, and then you process them and then you basically just have an output format uh, which can be then digested uh, by the firewall, right? So my mail is pretty good because it already comes with a lot of these lists. Um, so it's you know definitely another tool which I can highly recommend to you. Good. So <clears throat> in the next thing, uh, application control is also very effective, right? So if you are hosting a specific application like a web service, right? Um, then you you know okay, you know, legitimate users only use web browsing or SSL. Right, and you will be surprised of how much other applications the firewall gun is actually detecting. And then, if you kind of often look in your logs and check out kind of the source countries, you can often see countries where you know that there are no users, real users, coming from these countries. Right, and straight away you know, okay, uh, you know, with limiting down the applications, so you're only allowing specific applications, you're already kind of with this reducing the attack surface. Imagine, for instance, um, you allowing RDP, remote desktop inbound. Now, something which you definitely should not do, right? But unfortunately, often when you check your logs as the firewall guide, you see that, you know, things like this have been allowed in the past and not always can you kind of lock this down straight away, right? But applying these measurements, like for instance, you know, maybe, you know, this is kind of RDP on a, on a custom port. And then if you only allow RDP on this custom port, then it's getting pretty tricky for, for the hacker to kind of actually find out what service actually is allowed uh, via, via this port, okay? Good. So another one would be then also the IPS system to block these information disclosure attacks, right? Um, so here, these ones you always need to customize because information disclosure attack are usually kind of uh, kind of on a, on a, uh, from a severity level qu quite low, right? Um, so you kind of you need to be quite rigid here to kind of block these ones, and you need to do a bit of testing there as well. Um, good. Okay. So <clears throat> now let's say kind of the hacker did it work and kind of found out. Okay, you're running uh, a web server. Um, and it uses kind of a vulnerable uh, version of IIS version 6, for instance, okay? Good. So now what he would do is, okay, he knows that there, you know, this software what you're running, it's exploitable, and now he kind of runs an exploit. Now, my example of IIS 7, 6 is now, that's, you know, really old, right? But obviously, um, the important thing what we have to recognize here is um, this is a real risk right and the risk which never gonna go away when you're hosting a data center right because as long as we can have software software gonna have bugs and some of these bugs will be you know exploitable by hackers right and also kind of here kind of i draw kind of a, a cloud like a, the internet right but this guy here does not necessarily need to be on the internet it can also be an internal user Okay, so what we kind of need to be aware that this risk, what we have on the data center is that, you know, we can always, there can always be a new bug, something nobody is aware of, only a couple of hackers maybe, right, um, which they can use to kind of exploit a vulnerability in the software we have installed, which isn't patched yet, maybe there isn't even a patch available because nobody knows about it, okay? So again, this is a risk what you're always going to have when you're hosting services and you can't get away with it because um, you're hosting a service and yes, a service needs to be accessed by users, okay? So otherwise, what do you need the service for, right? So this is again a risk um, which uh, never gonna go away. Okay, so it's a very important one. Okay, so how can we then block the exploit? Well, first of all, 
what you want to do if if it is SSL, right? If it uses SSL, the servers, then we need to, to um, kind of apply SSL decryption to decrypt the SSL traffic. So with this, we can look inside of the SSL traffic and then block the text inside. So for instance, apply you know an IPS profile tool and then kind of block known exploit code on the IPS. Okay. <clears throat> Challenge is that. These exploits, especially if this is kind of a new zero-day exploit, uh, while Palo Alto Networks is certainly really good at kind of picking them up and then always giving out kind of an emergency uh, content update as well for new exploit um, things, right? Uh, chances are that uh, you can also be attacked by a zero-day and this is not detected by the firewall, okay? So, and that's something <clears throat> kind of exploit prevention from a firewall point of view is very challenging, right? Because it's something that happens on the on the endpoint, on the server itself. Okay, so that's why also Palo Alto Networks were thinking, okay, right, we're doing a lot of good things on the firewall, but we also need to look at the endpoint, at the server, right? Uh, what happens there? And um, that's why they, you know, also uh, developed a next generation endpoint security solution called Traps. Now, obviously. In this course, we're going to focus on the firewall, but I still want to kind of, you know, just give you a quick overview here because, uh, as you will see later on, uh, the fact that this is part of Palo, Next Gen Palo Alto Network's uh, security platform also benefits you, uh, whom, whom you have the, the, the firewall, okay? So, so when we look at these exploits, um, with an exploit, what happens is that um, the hacker sends data to your server. Like, if it's a web server, just kind of a web request. Okay, so and as part of the web requests, he kind of includes data, and obviously your your server application has to process this data. So and by processing the data, if there's a bug, right, that, that can be exploited. The, you know, the by processing the the, the application is kind of processing the data, and this then causes a misbehavior of the application, and now suddenly your application does something which it was not originally intended to do. Okay, so effectively what an, a hacker tries to do with an exploit always tries to get your application to do something what he wants, right? Um, kind of run some commands and, and, and stuff like this. Now, for this, it's important that um, hackers always need uh, to use certain exploit techniques, right? So in order to exploit a vulnerability, a hacker always needs an exploit technique. One example, for instance, would be buffer overflow, right? So imagine here you have your Microsoft IIS server, right? If you run the application, it will reserve an error in memory, okay? And now buffer overflow would mean that there's a misbehavior of the application, and now suddenly IIS is accessing an area in memory which it did not previously reserve, okay? So now when when the when the exploit or the the um, the ex uh, the the hacker runs its exploit code right. What we will first do is we'll do some types of kind of memory corruption, like heap spray, for instance, where he reserves different area of, of the memory places there as malicious code. Then he's going to trigger the um, uh, the buffer overflow, and now basically the your Microsoft IIS will now load the code of the hacker. Right, and I'll basically execute the code of the hacker, and with this, he can now execute a couple of uh, commands, for instance. Okay, so, and that's really effective because of the simple fact that if a hacker finds out about a vulnerability, he will be able to do this, right? Because you have to, by definition, you have to expose your application to users. Okay, um, so now the effectiveness of traps here really comes in because, first of all, we don't need kind of to know about the, uh, the the software bug, right? And we also don't need to know about the exploit code, right? The only thing what we need to know about are these exploit techniques, right? So now imagine we use traps and our traps blocks these exploit techniques. It blocks the heap spray or it blocks uh, the buffer overflow, right? So with this, without knowing the bug nor the exploit code, it blocks the attack, complete zero day protection. Okay, so so that's kind of um, just actually these exploit prevention is just one measurement uh, what traps is doing. The same like the firewall, also traps has multiple protections, right? Exploit prevention is only uh, one of them, uh, but you can see kind of the effectiveness here. And the reason why I wanted to highlight this with you is really the fact that you know traps is part of the security platform. Meaning, if tr if there's any customer mode in the world having traps, um, identifies kind of a new type of zero-day malware, this information is provided into the Threat Intelligence Cloud to Wildfire, right? And then this information is then also provided down to to your firewall, right? So, but, you know, keeping this in mind, I think is um, very important. Good. Now, <clears throat> following on with our attack, okay? So, 
let's just assume that the exploit was successful. Okay, what the hacker now tries to do or needs to do is actually accessing the internet to download an additional executable file. Um, now you asked my why. You know, he already kind of exploited a vulnerability. He kind of access to the server. And yes, um, but okay. What we need to keep in mind is that exploits are usually always limiting. Right? So it always depends on the exploit, what the hackers are able to do, but most exploits are rather restrictive. I mean, the hacker can maybe run a command or do a couple of things, but it doesn't have advanced functionality. And remember, these attacks are called APT, Advanced Persistent Threat, meaning that um, what the hacker really wants to gain is persistence. Now, an exploit in a lot of cases, when you run an exploit against an application, it's crashing the application. So it's kind of quite noisy, right? Generates a lot of logs, right? So not, not nothing where you want you want to get want to happen too many times because you know administrator will notice. Um, so with this, an exploit, you know, for the final attack isn't really good enough, right? It's only really a middle step, uh, which the hacker uses to go out to the internet, download an executable, and this executable does then the real malware, which takes full control of the server. Okay, so now, how can we block this? So first of all, the, the server is now accessing the internet, and this is important, right? With the exploit, it is now the server itself who is initiating the communication out to the internet, meaning you need to allow your, or kind of, the hacker needs you to allow internet communication to your server. Unfortunately, this is something which we see quite often that when you have internet facing servers then they also have permission to access the internet to initiate a communication to the internet and that's bad right and that's something what we need to control right because often of a lot of these you know uh, requests are required maybe i don't know you need to kind of update your antivirus software and stuff like this um but now with the application control with the app id what we can do is we can say okay right the server is allowed to access the internet but the only thing you can do is microsoft update and semantic update for instance okay and that's it right so with this automatically reduce the attack surface and we do not allow him to do anything else and with this automatically block uh, the malicious ex, uh, request to can download the executable file other things, so let's say you do need to allow, you need to be more open and allow kind of also web browsing or SSL, right? Here then we obviously definitely want to block malicious URLs. Uh, beside this, maybe also block unknown URLs. Maybe even better, allow access only to very specific URLs, right? Because, you know, such a positive allow model is always better because you, especially with servers, you can be that restrictive where you're saying, okay, I'm allowing you access to this, this, and this URL and nothing else. So with this, everything else is blocked automatically. Okay, so especially with internet facing servers, um, this is kind of, I think, a very effective and an important measurement. Okay, good. So now, <clears throat> let's now say, so now we have download of the executable down to the server. So here, very important, we need to apply SSL decryption. Okay, and with SSL decryption, obviously beforehand, we already applied SSL inbound decryption to the server. Now, this would be a connection initiated by the server out to the internet. So this is now SSL outbound decryption what we need to uh, what we need to apply as well and with this again we get insight into the SSL tunnel we can see what's inside the tunnel and identify for instance a file the executable file and then block the download of the executable again here um, often it's not so easy to do this because of certain file downloads you need to allow but again with the security policy you can very easily define uh, a policy where you allow the download of executable from trusted sources but block it from everywhere else and this then is very effective good then obviously our antivirus including <coughs> wildfire if it knows the malware already can can block it and and then we have wildfire so for anything unknown especially the unknown executables there we have wildfire meaning um here what can happen so let's say over here we have the internet Okay, and let's say on the inside, we have your data center. Okay, so if now a file traverses uh, the firewall, right, this file can now be sent to Wildfire for analysis. And this is good in two reasons. One, after the exploit, if the server tries to download a file from the internet, right, but also maybe you have some um, services where you allow users to upload files to the server. Right. So this is also kind of another example where this kind of additional security check is very effective. Okay. So and now what Wildfire is doing is it's basically trying to identify the malware based on its behavior, right? So why antivirus only checks kind of a signature, 
right? Checks against kind of known a list of known malware. Uh, Wildfire has another approach that really checks the behavior. So let's say in the same way, like you know, you would install an application on your PC or open a PDF file, they would you know do this in the cloud, right? So run it in a virtual instance and then look at the behavior. And if they see then a combination of you know mal typically malicious behaviors like changing registry values, um, injecting code in other processes, trying to access a command and control server on the internet, maybe even kind of making connections to certain IP addresses, URLs, which have been previously seen uh, with other attacks, right? Then this is obviously a combination of activities where we can clearly say, yes, this is malware, right? And with this, just after five minutes, um, Wildfire then delivers down, or otherwise, actually, the firewall downloads from Wildfire an antivirus update with a new list of signatures. And the important thing is that these updates every five minutes include signature updates not only from the files you uploaded to the Wildfire cloud, but from every other customer around the world who participates in this. Okay, so if there was, you know, an attack scene anywhere else in the world just five minutes earlier, you're protected, which is, you know, a very effective thing. Um, <clears throat> One common concern with wildfire is that we upload data to the cloud, especially over here in, in, in Europe, right? Um, so, but the important thing what we need to keep in mind is the file type. So for instance, here we can see Flash, executables, Java, Android APKs. Now, as long as you are not a software development company, you should not have any concerns uploading these kind of files to the cloud because they do not include private details. Okay, so so this is kind of first of all, you know, just saying yes or no, we upload or we don't upload. Uh, it's not that simple, right? We need to distinguish really between the different file types first of all. Okay, then there are certainly file types like PDFs and Office files, and let's again assume you have a service where users upload data uh, to your application, right? And maybe this is private related. Then you often need to make a decision if you kind of get them scanned or or not. Okay. But again, with granular security policy on the firewall, you can do exactly this decision. Okay. Lastly, then there's also email kind of URL links. So if there is <clears throat> an email transported via SMTP or POP3, then the firewall will analyze the email. And if it finds some links in the email, it will send these links to Wildfire, and the Wildfire will check them again uh, for malware and since version 8 also for phishing. Okay. Good. Now. The important thing to realize about Wildfire is that Wildfire is not just a sandboxing solution, what I just explained, right? It's really a threat intelligence cloud because it's kind of collecting all of these different indicators of compromise and then um, provides protections for different kind of threat prevention uh, solutions. So for instance, you know, obviously it generates the AV signatures, right? But then let's say uh, we see from where was the file downloaded. So we can then update URL filtering solution uh, with the kind of the malicious URL. Uh, we have maybe seen that the, the file tries to connect to a command and control server and tries to resolve uh, certain DNS uh, CNC names. So then here we kind of update the DNS signatures or we have seen maybe a certain type of command and control traffic where we can update the IPS system with command and control signatures. Okay, so with this really kind of the entire system is integrated and this, this is important because what we want to do here is if a hacker launches kind of a new threat, a new malware campaign, right? What we want to do is kind of really reduce the window of opportunity, right? Usually kind of hackers assume that they have between 24 to 48 hours uh, where they can do whatever they want before, you know, antivirus companies for, uh, especially, you know, cope up with it and have protections, have their kind of systems patched, okay? So here with Wildfire, reducing these this window of opportunity from 48 hours to five minutes, that obviously makes a big difference, right? And we can only effectively do this if we kind of use all of these indicators of compromise, what we collected, um, and then distribute this to the other systems and really distribute this also worldwide to, to all customers. Good. Now, Wildfire does have a disadvantage, uh, which is the fact that, you know, the firewall was designed to transport data or manage data um, at a very high speed and low latency, okay? So this means that if there's a file which hasn't been seen by uh, Palo Alto Box before, it will be uploaded to Wildfire, but in the meantime, the file has to send this through because it cannot cache them. It's not a server like an email server who can quarantine files, okay? So, you know, 
the file has to go through. Difference is that after five minutes, you will receive uh, a wildfire analysis report where you're basically getting told, hey, listen, we have seen a file traversing uh, your file, which we believe are malicious, right? And Palo Alto Networks not only tells you it's bad, they also tell you why they believe it's bad. So for instance, here you can see, you know, simulated keyboard and mouse movement, uh, connected unregistered domains, right? All of these um, events, um, then, you know, uh, suggest that this is malware and then you can make a decision on your own as well okay good okay so <clears throat> now we're at a stage where we have uh, a server inside of our data center which is now infected with malware okay the important thing is you know these hackers they want to earn money right so usually kind of they want to exfiltrate data they maybe just want to use your server for other criminal activities right but for this they need to get access it means now the hacker or Better to say the malware infected device or server now needs to establish a command and control channel to the command and control server of the hacker. Okay, and how they usually do this is that first of all they try to resolve a new uh, domain, right? So the hacker, for instance, includes a domain generation algorithm into the malware where he knows that tomorrow the malware going to try to resolve a domain beefbread.com. Okay, so he registers the domain with the IP address of its command and control server, right? And then tomorrow the server can try to resolve this via DNS. Now Palo Alto Networks with an anti-spyware uh, solution also blocks kind of these known uh, DNS command and control queries. Okay, so with this, this is blocked, so that's good. Um, the challenge just, just is here now that this DNS query comes from the DNS server. So kind of if you look at the firewall logs, it looks like the DNS server is infected, but obviously we know it's not the DNS server, it's the, the machine behind it who kind of send the DNS query who is infected. Okay, so, and for this we also have a little nice feature called a DNS sync call, which means the file owner sends a fake response back to the server with kind of a fake IP address, an IP address is not used anywhere else, okay, and if we now see any device trying to access this IP address, we know straight away, okay, right, this must be a server who is actually infected. So this is kind of a, another way to to identify devices which are infected with malware. And by the way, these DNS signatures, they are one of the, the key indicators, right, how we can actually lock down, actually see and find and identify devices which are already infected with malware. Good. Now, going on from here, um, there are some other means what we can do as well to block command and control traffic. So anti-spyware, for instance, includes uh, signatures for command and control traffic. Um, then app ID is very effective, right? Um, because any application traversing the firewall is identified as an application. Okay. Um, now, Paul Airbox obviously doesn't know every application, um, and especially these kind of command and control traffic applications, they are not known, right? But if you imagine, if we know everything else, right, so we know all the good stuff, means we know and we only allow the good stuff, and then we block everything else. So with this, we then block the unknown and, um, you know, block also the unknown applications and with this potential zero-day command and control traffic. Um, to be honest, um, command and control traffic, which is kind of application-based and comes up with unknown applications, five years ago, we have seen this quite often. Um, in nowadays, these command and control traffics are more web-based, so we see them less and less, but it's still, I think, a very important measurement to reduce the attack surface. Good. So now, let's imagine the hacker really <clears throat> did a good job and got fooled through and have now kind of a server infected with malware, established command and control channel. Um, so now, you know, we have, we're in serious trouble. Well, you are in serious trouble if your network looks like this, or if, especially your data center looks like this, meaning, you know, you just have one big data center, and once a hacker is inside of the data center, you can connect everywhere else, right? So what you really want to do here is also implement a zero trust architecture, right? And especially for data center, it means uh, to kind of also control east-west traffic, right? So if we kind of talk about communication from servers out to the internet, we talk north-south north, traffic, and then between applications, so for instance, from the web server to the application server, and then communication from application server to database server, right? This kind of, this east-west traffic, we should definitely also make sure that this communication goes over, over firewall. Obviously, you know, it doesn't have to be a, a hardware appliance, it can be virtual firewalls as well. Um, so that you know the traffic doesn't have to leave your your virtualization infrastructure uh, neither and can still be secured. 
And by the way, if you're interested in security best practices for Palo Alto Networks, then check out the blog on our webpage. Here in the best practice section, you can download this worksheet with over 120 best practices for the next generation firewall. And very soon, we will also launch a security best practice training with a lot of videos explaining all of these security best practices in detail. So if you're interested, then sign up to our mailing list and we will let you know as soon as this free training is available.